you know, scholars hadn't really thought to calculate and project out to the end of the current cycle. It really wasn't on the map for them until 1966 when the great Maya scholar Michael Coe wrote his book called The Maya. Now, I'm going to tell you something here that's probably politically incorrect or at least academically incorrect uh, because you know, there's a lot of hand-waving among the scholars now talking about all this craziness in the marketplace and they're being called upon too, you know, for interviews with the media to talk about the uh, 2012 date and professional Maya scholars like archaeologists and epigraphers, those who decipher the hieroglyphic writing. Um, amazing work that they've done, really. But the tendency has been to attribute this 2012 doomsday meme to, as uh, David Stewart, famous epigrapher, said, to New Age hacks. Uh, it is pretty easy, you know, it's, there is a tendency to sort of think that 2012 is just an invention of the New Age marketplace or something like that. Uh, but no, it's an actual artifact of the tradition. The fact is that it's in Michael Coe's book, The Maya, where you find the first association between this 2012 cycle ending and Doomsday. He languages it in terms of Armageddon and Apocalypse. And, and everything kind of came out of that. In, in 1975, Frank Waters wrote a book called Mexico Mystique, and he dealt with it. Uh, he actually used uh, Michael Coe's calculation uh, for the date, which was about a year off. Um, uh, and so I've been very interested in the whole story of this movement, of this idea, this unstoppable idea. And things really started to get rolling um, in the 1970s and 1980s when other popular writers like uh, Terence McKenna and Jose Arguez, uh had their own takes on this. Um, uh, there, there's a phenomenon in the popular marketplace where people tend to look at this material and then there's a tendency to create their own system, like an idiosyncratic model or system. And some of that's kind of interesting, actually. Some of it's very clever and inventive and is thought-provoking in many ways. but uh, Nobody was really looking at the actual tradition, you know, asking the right questions, investigating this from the vantage point of trying to reconstruct what the ancient Maya actually believed. And that's where I stepped into the picture in the late 80s when I started doing my research. Uh, you can ask the right questions and then generate answers. For example, where was this long count calendar invented? I asked that question and I went to the academic literature. Apparently this early Maya site called Izapa, fascinating place. Uh, no big pyramids, but there's carved monuments depicting episodes from the hero twin creation myth. There's also astronomical alignments, like uh, the, the site is uh, archaeoastronomical. The archaeology is oriented in certain ways to like the solstice horizon and, and that kind of thing. So there's a way to understand how the, the birth of the calendar is connected to astronomy as well as the creation mythology which contains spiritual teaching. So, you know, the, the work that I realized had to be done was an integration of the scientific astronomy with the spiritual teachings that you could find in the creation myth, because the two things go hand in hand. Myth and astronomy go together for the Maya. So I didn't want to just, uh, you know, forsake the interesting question of the spiritual te teachings connected with this that you can find in the creation mythology uh, to, to just do some kind of academic reconstruction. That would have been probably the safe thing to do, you know, because uh, my work has come under fire from the professional scholars because of my willingness to engage in, and uh, elucidate the spiritual teachings that the Maya had, uh, somewhat after the fashion of, say, like Joseph Campbell, the great mythologist who uh, compared, he, he sort of like went, he pierced below the surface level of the mythologies that he was examining. And so, you know, on the surface, they appear to be sort of culturally relative, quaint fairy tales of various people. You have different deity names for this, that, and the other thing. But the deeper level of these mythologies, there's an archetypal structure, uh, a level that speaks to the universal perennial wisdom that all traditions share. And that's what I was finding in the Maya creation mythology. So uh, this book is really in two parts. It's a twofer. 
the first part does go into the story and the history and, and telling the story of, of the whole evolution of the 2012 calendar and then how it was taken up by popular writers in the 70s. And continuing into you know, the recent decade where the whole thing has just exploded and there's been this you know, massive kind of thing in the marketplace around this. Um, and uh, I've, I've been interested in providing clear uh, sort of assessments of a lot of these theories. Uh, you know, because I think that a lot of them sort of are, are uh, not, well, not very well supported. You know, so for example, you have the, uh, the Nibiru planet, okay? Like uh, we could talk for an hour about this, but this idea that there's a lost planet out there. I've actually looked at Zechariah Sitchin's work with this. And it seems to me that he's uh, examined these cuneiform tablets and he's found this uh, decipherment that deciphers to mean uh, invisible planet. It's there in the cuneiform tablets. What is the invisible tablet? Or uh, the invisible planet? Well, if you look at the astrological doctrines, it's the lunar node. It's the intangible point where the solar path crosses the lunar path, indicates where eclipses can occur. And this point uh, processes around the zodiac and it de determines where eclipses happen in, a, in this large cycle. So everything's there. You know, you have this invisible thing that moves around and comes close to the sun every once in a while, and then disasters occur. You know, eclipses were thought to be disastrous events. But it seems to me like uh, Sitchin interpreted this literally, and so then it got turned into this actual literal physical planet out there somewhere beyond the solar system that swings in every once in a while. Uh, so there's a tendency to over-literalize one's interpretations of ancient metaphysical teachings or astrological teachings. And this happens a lot in the 2012 discussion. And you know, the original theory wasn't even connected to 2012. So somebody thought, oh, let's see, uh, you know, the Nibiru planet in 2012. Put them together, it's like the Reese's peanut butter cup or something. And, you know, it was a great idea, and that they ran with it. Um, so there's things like that that I think need to be called out. You know, because uh, a lot of these things are also tied to doomsday. So we just need to have a really clear idea of what the marketplace does with these kinds of things. And uh, you know, so if you go out into the Google sphere, you can find that. Uh, you know, a huge percentage of what's out there on 2012 is, is really misleading. There's a lot of misconceptions out there. But we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, there's a tendency then for people to look at that and say, ah, oh, the 2012 thing is just like Y2K, it's like just a hoax, it's a hoax. Uh, well, I find that to be sort of disingenuous, you know, 2012 is a true artifact of the Maya calendar tradition. And you know, I've been engaged in this reconstruction for 20 years. I found real things involving astronomy and spiritual teachings. Uh, and there's actually a lot, there's new evidence right now that supports this idea that I put on the table 15 years ago. And it involves uh, this rare astronomical alignment that culminates in the years around 2012. I'm providing so many spoilers here. You still have to buy the book. Um, so, uh, 